Great to see all of you here. Uh, and uh, this is, uh, I believe, there you are, Duke. This is our last our alumni last speaker series of the year. Uh, so thank you all for joining us, uh, and to Professor Morrison, of course, for moderating. And uh, this uh, this comes on the heels of we actually have had two events back to back. Our alumni speaker series last night brought Dan Gilbert to campus, and here we have uh, an alumni speaker series uh, on a very important and growing and. Uh, interesting area of the law, family law. I know many of you have a specific interest in family law and in pursuing family law either on your either on your own or in a larger practice. And so what you have here today uh, are, are a number of alums who are at the at the top of the field, uh, including the, the very the president of the State Bar of Michigan, Lori Budewick, uh, at the top of their fields in family law, uh, really a great opportunity for you to interact with them, talk with them, ask your questions about how to get started, how to build your career in this area, what you should be doing now, what classes you should take, all of those things as you, uh, as you hear from them about their experiences, as well as uh, begin to think about how you want to chart your own course in this very uh, important and interesting <coughs> uh, So thank you all for joining us. Thank you for being here. I hope it's helpful and fruitful discussion for all of you. Um, please feel free to move forward if you want to. <laughs> uh, and uh, to our panelists, we'll just project to the back of the room so that everyone can hear. Uh, but I also want to say one last thing. Thank you to Professor Morrison again for moderating and joining us today. Uh, on Monday, April 4th, we also have a very special uh, gathering in here. Uh, it's the Levin Center's last event of the year on mindful lawyering, the ethics of knowing when to say no. Senator Levin will be here as well as uh, Reg Reggie Turner, Reginald Turner, and, and Judge Nancy Edmonds. Uh, talking about ethical lawyering and how to be mindful of it as you move forward in your career. So we're expecting that will also be a great discussion. Be sure to be here in this room on Monday at noon. Lunch will be provided as always, uh, and it should be a really great, um, a really great discussion. So with that, I'll turn it over to Professor Morrison, and thank you all. Thank you to our panelists for joining us today on this wonderful afternoon. And uh, Professor Morrison, I'll turn it over to you. Are we doing? Uh, are we doing recording, or can I? Spend my time over here. I don't want to spend your time wherever you want. Okay. They'll be from here. They will be from here. Okay. <laughs> Good afternoon, all. How are you? Good. All right. We little, little enthusiasm and some food going here. Um, I'm Del Morrison, professor. And among, for those of you who don't know, I teach uh, family law, um, among other things, children and the law. And it's got to do with kids or kids or families. I pretty much cover domestic violence uh, law as well. And I'm just here to, I'm gonna in, do a brief, the brief bio part, and I'm then let each of our speakers introduce themselves and tell you about their practice and, and more of what, what got them into family law, we hope, and how they pursued it right out of, whether it's right out of law school, et cetera. Um, so I'm just gonna give you sort of the brief, the briefest, because they all have like, you know, long resumes that I can spend some time with. I think we're starting at the end with um, Lloyd uh, Boot, Boot win, like suit, but with a B, right? Um, uh, she's a shareholder at Nichols, Sachs, Swank, Sinblack, and Bootwig um, in Ann Arbor, where she focuses her practice on uh, matrimonial law. And uh, she's president of the State Bar of Michigan <coughs> and has represented Washtenaw County on the, uh, uh, the SBM board commission, uh, board of commissioners for 12 years. Uh, so she was also, she served as, prior to being uh, State Bar of Michigan president, uh, she served as president-elect in 2014 and 2015. She was president of the Washington County Bar Association. Um, and she previously bar junkie. Mm -hmm. Pardon? Said I'm a bar junkie. Well, you're a bar <laughs> junkie. <laughs> so, you know, and, and getting active in your bar is a great way to make people a network, so do that. Start as a student. Um, and, and also, prior to practicing law as an associate, um, she, uh, a litigation attorney at Collins, McKinney, and Filbert in Ann Arbor. Graduated uh, from Otters at the University of Michigan in Arbor. You're an Arborite, apparently, too. You have left there, except to come to Europe, which I'm very happy to have her. Um, with a bachelor's degree in Spanish and economics, and a JD from right here at Wayne. Um, interested in and issues, maybe you also want to talk about the de stressing you do here, because I always talk to my students about family law can, can stress you out a little bit there. Um, so, so if you she can talk about that. You come next Monday and learn some mindfulness. Um, next, I think we have Carlo Martina. 
Um, he graduated from Wayne State in uh, 1979. Um, he pra his practice focuses only on family law. Uh, Carl was a member of the State Bar of Michigan Family Law Section Council, Executive Board from 2003 to 2008, serving as, as its chair from 2008 to 2009, and as co-chair of the Section of Family Support Committee and Court Rules Committee, another bar junkie of some sort here. Um, represented the section on the SCA of Child Support Formula, formula Man. Oh, that's you, huh? Child Support Formula Man. Now we know who to talk to. So if you take a family law with me and try to figure out the family law, I think we can get some insights here on the Child Support Manual. Um, let's see, what else? Um, written for Eagles, two volume set of Michigan Family Law addressing uh, developing a family law practice. So you get some practical experience um, on how to get out there and do that and given numerous seminar presentations on behalf of the State Bar uh, Family Law Council and ICA on, var ICA on various um, areas of family law. And uh, AB rated by Martin Dale Hubbard since 2005, and a super lawyer. Michigan super lawyer since 2010. So we are, we are in great bar set and in the presence of super lawyers. Um, next to uh, next to is uh, Marie Pulte, did I pronounce that yeah. right? Uh, family law attorney, mediator, and arbitrator. A little bit on ADR here. Uh, practicing primarily in Livingston, Oakland, and Washtenaw, and Wayne. Right, primarily in four, four different <laughs> counties. Uh, for the past 29 years. Uh, she is a trained collaborative attorney, which is another aspect of women's family law, and past board member of the Collaborative Practice Institute of Michigan. Past chair of Family Mediation Council of uh, Michigan, <coughs> and presented various family law dispute resolutions. Got member of the State Bar of Michigan Family Law Section, Alternative Dispute Resolution Section, and uh, the Collaborative Practice Institute of Michigan. So again, involvement, community involvement, as well as your practice. Uh, you're going you're gonna to hear that from all of these people. Uh, we have the, the, the Findling Wing over here next to me. Uh, Daniel Findling uh, is, a, uh, is a double wing, double warrior here. Uh, 93 grad of Wayne uh, Bachelor of Art Public Affairs and 97 uh, Wayne Law grad. Uh, a Phi Sigma Alpha National Political Science Honor, Warren Bronski Certificate, uh, D Business Top Lawyer, a Super Lawyer, uh, Craig's Detroit Business, AVO Top, uh, I to be Top Divorce Lawyer. So we've got the Super Lawyers, Top Lawyers, Bar Junkies, and last but certainly not least, uh, we have Fred Finley, uh, who is, uh, uh, was born, uh, you want me to tell him what you're doing in the board? Okay. Uh, been at this a little bit longer than some of us. Uh, born in uh, 1930 in Cologne, Germany, uh, and is, is the senior member, uh, present 85 years old. Uh, Holocaust, uh, Holocaust survivor, he came to the U.S. in uh, uh, September 24th, 1941. Worked their way through college and law school. Many of our students worked their way through college and law school. Um, and got a bachelor in psych uh, in, uh, from Wayne. Another, another double warrior, right? Bachelor in psych from uh, psych and sociology from Wayne and a KD from Wayne in 1956. Um, practice, started practicing Michigan, federal district in 57, uh, Sixth Circuit Court of Appeals in 71. Uh, Supreme Court of the United States have been in 62. Um, he has been guest lecturer, in, I, I, I could go on and on. Uh, and not only family law, and I think it'd be interesting to hear how family law and all the rest of your areas of law, bankruptcy, foreclosure, collective bargaining, uh, you know, ERISA, criminal law. So I always tell my family law students that family law is about, you know, a little mile long and in, in an inch deep. You gotta touch on everything. Um, and everything touches family law, so the connections, I think, are very in, uh, interesting. It's been a member of the Lawyers Guild, Vice President of the Detroit chapter. I could go on and on, the, the, the accolades are, uh, and the, uh, the CV, or the resume outside of academia is extensive. So you've got the, 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 the biographical information, a little bit of uh, uh, where they are, where they came from, and how they're connected to Wayne. And, uh, we're, are we going uh, left to right, right to left? Uh, <laughs> left to right. <laughs> left to right, yeah. Okay. So I'm up. You're up. And I'm talking about whatever I want. Yeah, well, <laughs> so here's the format. Yeah, basically you're talking about whatever you want. The format, you, take, you know, each take three, five minutes to talk.
talk about sort of family law, how you got into family law, whatever through bio and uh, the topic of Leo. And then we have post some hot topics questions, right? So what is happening when I talk about the practice of it, they'll sort of cover how you're engaging in the hot topic and how it goes in the and whether those, you know, big con law cases uh, actually how they actually work in practice down on the the, the on the ground in, in your individual practice. But you know, introduce to how you got into family law initially and then we'll come back to it. Okay. All right. Um, well, when I after I graduated from Wayne, I went to night school here at Wayne. I was a night student. I graduated in four years, um, and I worked during the day uh, as a law clerk for a, a, a law firm that defended road conditions and uh, railroads in personal injury cases, um, and uh, that was in Southfield. Then I met my husband my last year at Wayne. Program. His brother was in my law school class, and um, so that's how I met my husband, and he was a CPA at the time, and he um, decided to go to law school at the University of Michigan, so I needed to, well, we got married, and I had to move to Ann Arbor. So um, I found a job at, um, she was saying, Common and Kinney and Philbrook, which is a law firm in Ann Arbor that does insurance defense work. So I represented AAA, auto owners, um, Michigan Miller's Mutual, a number of auto So um, I happened to be looking on the e-journal one day uh, when it was a fairly new commodity. I don't know if all of you know about it, but it's a great, if you don't subscribe to the Michigan, the State Bar of Michigan e-journal, you should. Um, but they have classified ad section, and I noticed in there that there was a law firm in Ann Arbor looking for an experienced um, attorney. And so I answered the ad, and I went and interviewed with them. I mean, I had 10 years of experience, which was way more than they were looking for. Uh, but the fit was just perfect. Everybody there was a woman, had young children, um, and was involved in the bar and ICLE. Just a great group of women, and I just I really wanted to make the move to that firm. The only drawback was they did family law, and <laughs> and I wasn't sure I wanted to do that. Um, but um, I you know I took the leap, and um, I, I've never looked back. Um, it is the most at once challenging and rewarding uh, practice area that I can really imagine. Um, and we can talk about that more, I'll pass it on to Carlo, but um, I, I love it. I find it to be incredibly fulfilling. Of course, you have your good days and your bad, um, but you know, and I don't know that there's any other practice area where you get Christmas cards from people thanking you five years later for what you did for them and for their family. Um, or you know you get big hugs after a case is concluded, or people telling you that you know you really changed their lives for the better. So um, it, it's very challenging, but feels great. It's very rewarding as well. So I'm really glad I made the move. I've been there 15 years, and like I said, never. And it's a wonderful, it's a wonderful firm too. I think every <laughs> every member of her firm uh, has pulled her weight in terms of doing things in both the local and the state bar. I mean, it's really yeah. very. I got out of here in 79, and I have to admit, I never thought I'd be doing family law. Uh, I had a, a, a professor, Frederica Lombard, uh, as a family law professor, and she was wonderful. <coughs> but but uh, that's not where I found work. I mean, 
I found working on kind of general practice that had to do with a lot of personal injury and litigation work and things like that. And then slowly that evolved where they were doing partnership dissolutions. So I started handling partnership dissolutions. And uh, literally one day, one of the partners said, you know, uh, we have a potential divorce case coming in here and uh, maybe some of these you know, things that you learn in terms of you know, dissolving business partnerships might be practical here, but we don't want to lose this client when you take this case. <coughs> and so I jumped in on it and uh, called just about everybody I knew who was doing some family law just to get some ideas of what I, what I had to do. And it was, but I made my way through. Uh, that slowly evolved because I saw changes in the law in terms of personal injury litigation uh, with, with a high stress on advertising and things like that. The, uh, tort reform was coming into effect, so uh, the market was, was shrinking, uh, and yet my divorce practice had started growing. And uh, I began to realize I didn't want to be at the tail end of the PI trend because that was, seemed to be really going in the wrong direction for me. So I decided to put all my effort and I really don't regret it. I really like it. It's uh, sometimes it can be a bit much. I mean, you figure it's almost like being an ER doc. Uh, they come in, they're in pain. Almost any touch will make them scream. You know, so you have to kind of triage what the situation is. I mean, it's like the car about to be repossessed. His husband's not making the car payments. You know, you got to take care of those immediate things. Uh, kind of get things calm. Start collecting information. Figuring out you know, how they're going to transition to the next part of their life. And it really feels good. I mean, it, I mean, you have to be willing to, like, like an ER doc, be willing to accept people sometimes at their most difficult time. But like uh, Rory was saying, uh, their, uh, the thanks that they uh, give you and uh, the effect that hopefully most of the time you'll have been able to have on their lives and their, their ability to parent ability to financially survive will actually, you know, really have a meaningful effect, so it feels good. And, uh, you know, like Gloria, I was kind of a bar junkie in terms of getting involved in the family law section, which, by the way, uh, students can go to their meetings as well. It's open. Uh, you can belong to the student section of the state bar family law, uh, family law section, and it's reduced rate. Uh, I think you can also get the family law bar journal, which is great. Uh, and, and make yourself known there. Lawyers all over the state, if you're really interested in family law, that are really immersed in family law. I mean, they're, they're, they, are, they are pushing the limits in terms of where things should go to try to come up with a fair, more equitable way of dealing with all the issues that come up in family law. So it's a great environment to be in. Also, wouldn't it be hard, you know, bad if you rub elbows with somebody who might be a young associate or a clerk next summer or something like that. Uh, there are committees that you can be volunteer to work on. So there's a lot of things that can help you get involved there. Um, and don't forget, I don't regret any of the choices. It was an unusual, it was an unusual route. I started off in law school with a little sign that said NLRB or bust. <laughs> Boom! <laughs> Never went to the NLRB. But, uh, <laughs> but uh, it all worked out. And then I got to marry an incredible family lawyer myself. <laughs>
city to provide um, court appointed attorneys for people who are charged with small time crimes. And I did that um, while I was uh, waiting for my bar results and then I worked there as an attorney for two years. That was great experience for working, um, learning how to talk on your feet because we were in court every single day. Had a lot of trials, both uh, jury and bench trials. So it was a wonderful experience, but it also taught me that I didn't want to do criminal law. Um, there are, you know, everybody needs to, has, has a right to a good defense, and there are some attorneys who are very, very good at it, but that was not um, my preference. And then I worked for two years at UAW Legal Services, which um, was basically an office for auto workers and their families, dealing with a lot of different civil types of cases. So we handled anything from landlord-tenant disputes to, you know, somebody had a driveway port and the contractor did a bad job, um, and some uncontested divorce work. But that was also a really good experience. Um, I didn't have to bill clients. We had a wonderful support staff. We had a research bank. We had experts at our disposal. Did a lot of trials, not worrying about whether I was going to get paid as a private practitioner. So again, it was a really good experience. I got a, lot, a wide range of exposure to a number of type areas of law, but it was not fulfilling for me. And family law is what I really wanted to do. And so uh, I went back to the free legal aid clinic, this time as an attorney supervising law students. So I was there for about six years. That was probably the most rewarding um, time of my career. I think I really enjoyed the one-on-one -on -one work with the students. I really enjoyed seeing them have the same you know, positive experiences I had and the growth and, you know, realizing what life is like for somebody who's going through a divorce process. Um, so when I went into private practice, um, after that, I focused my practice on family law. And that's what I've been doing since 1996 in private practice. <coughs> my practice has changed some in that I've, I'm a very big proponent of ADR, mediation, collaborative practice. Um, I took the mediation training. Was involved in mediations as an attorney representing clients, but I took the training to become a mediator around 2000 and have been mediating since then. And then collaborative practice came to Michigan probably 12 years ago. I'm not sure exactly how long, but anyway, when it first came to Michigan, I took that training too. And so I'm trying to get my practice to focus more on the ADR, although I represent a lot of people who are um, in abusive relationships and sometimes it's a little difficult for the ADR in those situations. So. That's how I arrived to where I am. I'm really happy to be in private practice. Some days I want to pull my hair out like everybody here, but it's a great experience. I haven't given this a lot of thought before this moment, but I just wrote down some notes um, that I thought I'd share with you if I had this opportunity. Um, I think what we heard from Lori and, and Carlos resonated with me a little bit. Sometimes you chase your passion, and other times your passion finds you. And I think my journey was more of the passion found me more than me chasing my passion. I work, I come from a family of lawyers, uncle, judges, and lawyers, father of lawyers, and uh, with a law firm. I remember working as a law clerk for a family law lawyer, and I was a runner, just you know, go file things. The guy got disbarred while I was working for him. And I thought to myself, I never want to run this business. Are you kidding me? This is crazy. Um, I wanted to go to law school, and when I went to law school at Wayne, I had the dream of being the greatest PI lawyer, making a fortune, doing whatever the case may be. And I worked with, uh, with Ms. Pulte at the Free Legal Aid Clinic. Enjoyed it. I got some experience. I uh, did well in law school, and I had choices uh, because I had good grades. I could go to a larger firm, or I can go into practice with my family, who has established practices. And everyone in my family, my father, my brothers, and so forth, each had different needs. And I chose the route of going within my family's practice. I didn't make any money. I made almost nothing. My friends who went to the Stokesock and Law Firm for starting out at $100,000 a year, I think I might have made $30,000 in the first year. Maybe, maybe less. I got a personal injury case. I love personal injury. I brought in a friend who was an, asso uh, an associate of my father's who got injured and I took over the file. And then I brought in Jeffrey Figer. And I sit in, I'm sitting in a jury trial in federal court. I got a $5 million jury verdict a few years out of law school. I bought my wife a Cartier watch. <laughs> I bought myself nothing. 
the case went to the U.S. Court of Appeals. Who loses in the U.S. Court of Appeals? I did. I got zero, and I'm depressed. What am I going to do? I'm not making money. I can't. And I thought, well, maybe if I took the skill sets that I've learned from working with Spiger, working with other lawyers, working with my family, and trying to apply them to an area like family law, maybe that would be a niche. And I hated it when I started. But I did it because I needed to make a living, just like everyone here is going to need to make a living while you're doing it. And then slowly, I started to like it, and then I started to love it. And I realized that family law, from my perspective, is about giving people voices, giving people an opportunity to be heard, even if sometimes you don't like what they're saying. They still need to have an opportunity to be heard. And the business of divorce is that sometimes you have to tell them, we can't do this because it's not economically feasible for anyone, or you'll go broke. If you chase everybody's desires, sometimes you have to have that talk, and you have to be realistic. And sometimes you flat out hate it. You flat out hate the position that your client is taking. You don't agree with them. You think it's maybe wrong. And I always turn to those clients and I say, this is what I think you need to do and why. If it's repulsive, of course, you don't do it. But I still feel an opportunity and an obligation to give them the voice, to let them be heard. And I truly find tremendous value in that. I found value in my practice. I have a number of lawyers that work with me now. Um, we do a lot of, we handle a lot of cases. I've worked with all the lawyers on the panel here. And my passion for family law found me. One other thing that I'm going to say that I never thought would occur in family law. The one thing that I wish I took in law school was more tax. Because whether you realize it or not, you were going to be looking at more tax returns. You're going to be looking at a tax return, and I learned it through hiring experts over the course of 20 years. You're going to be looking at tax returns and say, wait a minute, here's K-1 income. Here's a, and if that's something that you don't like, well then some of the higher end cases where, you know, where the money is to make may not be right for you. But it really is an important part of the practice of family law. Understanding business law, how businesses are created, what's a shell corporation, and so forth, right? Important concepts to know in family law. <laughs> well, <clears throat> um, I'm in the lim limelight of my career now. As you probably know, I've been in practice my 60th year of practice. I graduated from Wayne, <coughs> excuse me, in 1956. At that time, we didn't have a law school. We had dorms from us and a garage. <laughs> That's where we studied. Um, when I started practicing back in 1957, He only wanted to pay me $25 a week, full time. And I was desperate. And I knew that uh, I couldn't support myself even then on $25 a week. So I took a job at um, the Sheraton Cadillac Hotel as a salesman in a liquor store. The liquor store happened to be right on Michigan Avenue in the beginning of Skid Row. So I'm just talking.
a judge. <laughs>
certainly communication overlaps with it as well. We can't communicate because every time I try to talk to you, you scream back at me, right? I mean, that certainly um, you know, could be related to a lot of things, mental health being one of them. What you're saying is that there's a lot of mental disturbances in our society. Sure. It, it has to marry to wind up be resolved one way or the other. There has to be something in, the, in society that uh, triggers that. But anyways, uh, if you want to handle it, but be prepared. Be prepared when you practice family law or divorces that you have to have a strong constitution. Get a good night's sleep because you're going to get a lot. <coughs> it's a one of the most difficult forms of practice that you're going to have. Divorce law, very, very difficult emotionally. Um, we just want to take on some questions, some of you know that you've raised here. It's an interesting sort of the, the A, you can ask each other questions. I like that. Uh, take you know, like hand and step back and take notes. Um, and look at you all. The does anyone else want to sort of answer the sort of number one reason for divorce? Uh, or oh, I they, they tend to agree more with more than anything. I mean, people do have One of the problems um, is that the kind of collaborative sort of relationship that people have at the beginning where there's a lot of give and take, I mean, everything is fresh and everything like that, sometimes uh, evolves into, you know, everybody following their own separate agenda uh, and no longer kind of collaborating on a common goal. I mean, you can do different things as long as you continue to discuss what your common goals are. I mean, you can go through a lot of things. You can get through mental illness. You can get through a lot of things. I mean, loss is a terrible thing. Uh, but as long as I think people continue to uh, communicate, listen, uh, and, and react positively toward this common goal, uh, I think you can, uh, marriages can withstand a lot. Uh, but once somebody starts more selfishly looking after themselves as opposed to themselves as a couple, then you start having problems in terms of you know where they prioritize their time and their efforts and stuff like that. So, yeah, I think that's talking about sort of the inability to communicate about things that makes it tough, whether it's again that mental illness or, or finances or work or kids or. And I think you were saying that the second marriage is kids, right? A lot yeah. of times, yes, yeah, like stepchildren. Yeah. Issues. There was a recent I think article that were out there were dealing with how long it takes to become this blended family. And people, you know, the Brady Bunch concept. And it's like, really, it doesn't happen within the half an hour of a sitcom. <laughs> so, but depending on the ages of the children, up to 10 years, as you sort of become one family. And sometimes never, um, that you're just sort of two families living together, waiting for everybody to, you know, uh, to grow up and go to college or leave the, leave the house or live with their, their other parent. Um, so there's this you got to be ready for that um, for the second marriage. So let's um, um, let's talk about a few of the issues here. One thing, many of you, uh, particularly this end, and I think, you know, and I, I forgot to mention um, that uh, Daniel here was the, uh, we're referred to, I think, as the divorce guy. <laughs> Marketing, too. So, yeah. Yeah, it's like, but this idea of having to market oneself and get out there and connect, um, be one of the salesmen. Just so, sort of talk about yeah, how. There's a, there's a couple different ways that you would know, start to practice or if you are in a firm that you have to market, you need business, <laughs> that going on business. And certainly one way is if you go to the firm, a, a larger firm, maybe they have a network already in place that is just going to give you business. But if you, if you, if you want to get a job, let's say you've been practicing for 10 years and you want to get a job, they, they certainly would love to book a business if they want to if they're going to be hired on. Um, so I've, I've really taken two approaches to building a business. Um, I've done a lot of radio advertising So if you're a relationship person and you go
go out and you nurture relationships, whether it's with other lawyers and paying referral fees, um, then that's how you should be marketing your practice. If uh, if you're not a relationship person and you know, maybe direct marketing, whether it's you know, we do a lot of internet advertising, we do a lot of radio advertising under different brands. The divorceguy.com being a very broad brand, brand, Finding Law being a more you know, up, up scale brand and so forth. So I mean that's you know, my experience is that spending a lot of time and energy. In fact, I think I spend about 20% of my time, but that 25% of my time, just on marketing, just on marketing. Every day I'm working on it. How am I gonna nurture relationships? How am I gonna you know, advertise to sell your product? And then your product, after so many years, tends to speak for itself. And I think for every client that you do a wonderful job for, you're gonna end up getting two or three more clients. Hopefully. It sort of has that ripple effect as well. That's my answer. And that was the, the second piece of that is what I was gonna say. If you are an ethical attorney and you treat people with respect and you focus on doing a good job for your clients, you will generate your own business. You know, people will trust you, you'll get business from other attorneys, from your former clients, and you hopefully will get to a point where you don't really have to advertise. I mean, in this day and age, I think everybody has to have a website at least. <laughs> but I mean, paid advertising at some point would hopefully go by the wayside and your business would all be floating around. It also depends where you want your business to go. Just want to be fully employed at your hourly rate. That's one business model. If you want to, you know, be a multiple of your hourly rate, fully employed, that's another <coughs> business model. With that, um, what would you tell? Sorry, what would you tell these, but yourself, if you were coming out now and wanted to do um, family law? And I, I have to say, I have to back up, and any of you even heard me say this? It was a tap to something I didn't say and doing the So take tap. Um, <laughs> And I tell everybody, you know, it's like a huge tax in family law. It's usually, you know, okay, uh, child support is includable, you got know, spouse support in that kind of thing. And it's like make friends with a tax lawyer, um, you know, collaborate. So, but what, and, and most, I think they're all in practice. So um, what also do they all need to know and to be best prepared? What would make you want to hire if you were hiring, if any of you are hiring, please? Let us all know. Um, <laughs> a, a fresh out, newly minted member of the bar who's showing up to the family law, who started showing up to the family law section meetings or matrimonial section meetings and is ready to go. Diploma in one hand, uh, you know, coiffin diploma in one hand, and new, new bar passage uh, letter in the other. They want to come, and they want to get up there and work. Actually, they probably should be doing this before they um, well, certainly experiential learning um, is a, a key, so any sort of clinic, clinical work that you can do, um, or pro bono work under the court rule that allows students to practice under the supervision of an attorney, uh, some are clerkships at a law firm, um, a transcript that shows that you've taken tax law, yes, real estate law, uh, business law, I handle very, very high-end business cases where people are sole proprietors or members of closely held corporations. Um, and so knowing something about the different types of business structures um, and how they're taxed and how to value them is very important. Um, even having some international law um, on your uh, transcript would be helpful. Um, the world is very flat. People want to move around for fellowships, for educational reasons, for family reasons. Um, so knowing some things about international law would be helpful. Having a criminal law back um, class is, which I think is probably required, is even helpful um, because your professor is absolutely right. Family law is a mile wide in an inch deep, but sometimes it gets to be a mile deep yeah, depending yeah, on the well issue. High. So, and having some familiarity with the actual law. So there, there's, believe it or not, a lot of family law. There are statutes, there are um, court rules that pertain specifically to family law. Um, there's the Michigan Child Support Formula, which Carlos helped to write the most recent version of. Um, I would say go through, for example, go through the Child Custody Act on whatever, 
then under each of the best interest factors, look up the leading Supreme Court case on each of those, or look up the leading Supreme Court case on the things the court can do as conditions on parenting time, look up the leading Supreme Court case on uh, property, alimony, um, uh, child support, those kinds of things. Just get to have some general knowledge uh, about the area of law. And if you have, if you by any chance have any experience or education in uh, social work or psychology, uh, gosh, that is where I see an, a very big gap or hole. Um, in my community in Ann Arbor, we have a particularly rich population of uh, lawyers with some social work background, but it's not even enough. We, we, we need more. So uh, people who have L LMSWs or MSWs and going to family law are highly sought after. Uh, for the reasons that Dan said, there is a lot of, uh, there is a lot of uh, mental illness. Um, and even if it's not something that's diagnosed or being treated, it may be something that is just driving the dynamic in the family um, that somebody with social work background or psychology background could be helpful in way. And then too, reading child custody or psycho psychological evaluations, you understand those better. Um, those, because those can be incredibly complex um, documents to understand. So um, I know that's a pretty long list, so get busy. <laughs> Probably valuation because I think I had to take one. Oh, sure. But you know, the mental health issues or juvenile or juvenile mental health issues or family law mental health issues or. So ICLE does a lot of you know, ICLE is a partner partners with the state bar machine and they have um, webinars and they have books and they have all manner of um, education out there. But when you talk about juvenile law, it's interesting because I think most of us would probably agree that we consider that a different genre oh, of family law. And you know, I stumbled into a juvenile law case once and it was a pre-Sanders case where the constitutionality of what was going on was blowing my mind and then Sanders came along and said, thank, thank goodness. Yeah. Um, uh, so, you know, it was like being in a different universe. Oh, yeah. yeah. Yeah, I don't do juvenile. Yeah. Okay. Neither, what else? What, I, what I do think you need a, to know? For, for a, uh, a prospective employer looking at a, a young attorney coming out, I think having had some practical experience with clinics or, or, or clerking, but clinics are really important because a lot of people can, can know the law, but they can't seem to integrate it, they can't seem to you know, uh, handle a caseload, you know, they have a hard time you know, knowing what to do next. Uh, They've learned it in the abstract in law school, but like Marie was saying, you know, I mean, it's it's where you have to integrate that and communicate that and be effective at doing that, uh, that really makes you a lawyer. Uh, and I think for a firm looking for a potential young associate, particularly right out of law school, I think they would be happy to see them having had some clinic experience where they've actually handled cases. They, like we were saying, they know where to go, they know where to stand, they know what to say. I mean, the attorneys don't have to expend a lot of energy teaching them these basic things. They've already learned it because they've got some practical experience. Um, and then, of course, making sure you have the requisite classes to help you have the skills because uh, family law really uh, integrates a lot of different skills. I had a case just recently that we settled where uh, it was not only uh, a divorce case, but it was a case of assault, battery, uh, and intentional infliction of emotional distress. And I so, have your I, uh, that clock's wrong. So I'm like, we have, and I want to ask them oh. questions. So I think that was a good place. So anybody have questions? We have like five minutes apparently for a question and answer. I was looking over my calculator. Oh, yeah, it was 15 minutes. So yay. So anybody questions, comments? Um, uh, yeah. Thank you.
Thank you. you know, I just wanted to thank um, all five of you, but especially the elder, Mr. Fin Finley. It's an honor to be you know, in the presence of the Holocaust survivors. You know, thank you uh, for, for, uh, for sharing your time with us. Uh, you know, I, I'm, I have an interest in law and economics, and my question will surely come across as being some sophomore to the man on the first year of philosophy. Uh, you, and you, uh, I'd like to touch on um, the, 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 the psychological aspects of, of your work as, um, as you know, a, a family lawyer. Um, you, uh, uh, you, know, you, you, you spoke about you know, some psychology, and I could, I could sense that, rightly or wrongly, there is, if you will, even some implicit bias, even within marketing. Um, whether it be, you mentioned the, the, uh, uh, the firm you, you, you joined at an early stage in your career, what, you know, consists entirely of, of women lawyers, and, and the, web, the web address. Um, for obviously, for marketing purposes, the, the, fam you know, uh, the divorce guy. So I presume that maybe a, a greater proportion of, of clients may be uh, male. So could you speak to that aspect of you know, possible implicit bias within the judicial system, within the discretion of, of, uh, of, of judges? I'm not calling into question whatsoever at this. Sexual obviously. bias, whether they favor men or women? <laughs> In general, but maybe you know if you can maybe you know, um, and obviously I'm not calling into question you know ethics. Obviously, if we're in the company of super lawyers, the president of the state bar, but it is, is you know um, it, it, it does go beyond marketing, beyond you know a preference of, of a client, whether it be you know um, whichever spouse it may be, yeah. in presumably a heterosexual relationship may not be the case that that would maybe feel a greater affinity to work with someone of the same gender. Um, I'll be happy to address that. I mean, I think. Um, I think implicit bias is something that we all have to be keenly aware of on an ongoing basis every single day, whether we're interviewing a new client and deciding whether to take them as a client, or whether we're at a mediation and trying to size up the opposing party, whether it's the uh, other attorney that we're working for, particularly judges have, I think, an incredible responsibility to be aware of their own implicit biases. Um, there, I have written a blog on this. I have a blog, I've written a blog, and also a bar journal article on implicit bias, and the State Bar has had multiple seminars, another one coming up in Grand Rapids on the issue. Um, I think it's a good point, and I think that family law has come a long way in terms of battling implicit bias. Um, I think the over 12 cases were to be uh, helpful in that regard as well. Um, so, I mean, I appreciate that you have your finger on the pulse there, because I think it's really critical that we all have our finger on the pulse there. Other comments to that or other questions? Yes. Hi, um, I am a first year law student who's interested in going into family law, specifically working with domestic violence survivors. And you talked a bit about how divorce can be emotionally taxing. Could you talk more about the rewarding aspects of your job? I feel like that's often something we don't hear about. Both Marie and I have been involved uh, in the domestic violence area. Strangely, I was years and years ago. I was involved in a uh, uh, something that was put on by the National Council of Jewish Women uh, uh, called uh, Divorce Alternatives for Women. And then, about 20, uh, 15, 20 years later, I was involved with the uh, with Access, uh, an Arab community, helping them develop uh, responses to domestic violence there as well. Uh, so I, I, you know, it's it's amazing how uh, how cross cultural all of, you know th this problem is. Uh, I think to be able to protect somebody and to uh, give them some sort of hope that they're going to get beyond this, to uh, hopefully integrate them, maybe uh, getting some education, getting uh, social work help, help with their children moving forward is, is very, very rewarding. And it also, I mean, it gets you out into the community. You start picking up cases, not just domestic violence cases, but, you know, people that they know and this person helped me in a difficult time. It's really a great feeling. It, it's tough, though. Again, you got to kind of triage the situation quickly uh, because sometimes, you know, I mean, there's survival. So why don't we wrap up on that? One sentence from each of you, starting with and this is, of what you like about being a Leo, what you love, like, passionate about being a family, doing family law. 
when you did or if you, when you still do, and then we will, uh, then we'll wrap up from there. Thank you all. Well, my, I think the most rewarding part of uh, my handling divorces was when the family actually reconciled. <coughs> they actually reconciled and passed up. Um, it doesn't always work. I remember one, <laughs> once a um, couple came in and uh, I asked them, do you really want to get divorced? And they said, well, we're thinking about it. And I tried to patch them up, you know, and give them some assistance. So it took a lot to go to psychological. Next thing I knew, they went to another lawyer. <laughs> Okay. 